Hello and welcome to this webinar. I'm Natalie Starkey from Chemistry World and I'm here with you for the next hour with some brilliant science communicators who are going to be exploring how scientists can successfully engage with the public via the media. Now just to let you know this session will be recorded and shared with everyone who registered for the event. It'll also be available on demand on the Chemistry World website and the RSC members area indefinitely. And as usual for our webinars, this session's interactive, which means you can ask questions about any aspect of what's covered in today's session. We love to hear from our audience, so please do send us in some questions and I'll be able to put them to our speakers later on and I'll introduce them in just a minute. Now, before I introduce the guests joining us today, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself because although I'm here to host this webinar, I'm not a complete novice when it comes to engaging with the media. I do hope to be able to add some insight to the proceedings as we go along. My background is in science research, specifically earth and space sciences, but I crossed over to science communication in 2015 and I'm currently science media producer at Chemistry World. Now, it was during my first postdoc that I got more interested in communicating about science for a non-expert audience, and I made a successful application to the first BBC Expert Women course, where I received training on how to be interviewed on screen and radio, amongst other, amongst other things. Um, I was also interested, though, in writing about science, and after gaining a bit of writing experience with the newly formed The Conversation website and writing my own blog, focusing on my science, I eventually applied for an internship with The Guardian newspaper in London. London to learn more about how science is reported in the media and this meant I was working on a busy news desk but I was on the other side to what I was used to interviewing scientists about their work. Now what I learned is that the science journalists I worked with went to great efforts to report the science they were covering accurately. I was actually really very impressed with how careful they were and also how clever they have to cover so many different areas of science. I found it really impressive. Now, I know that's not necessarily the case at every news outlet, but on the whole, I've had a really positive experience engaging with the media as a scientist. So I've always been an advocate for scientists communicating their research to a wider audience. And the great thing is that there are so many different ways to do this. If you don't like speaking on live TV or radio, I personally love it. Well, that's fine. Maybe you prefer writing or maybe communicating via video content. There are so many options and I hope that by the end of this session, you'll go away with some new ideas and inspiration after you've heard from our amazing speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our guests today. If they'd all like to turn on their cameras, you'll be able to see their faces and I'll be able to tell you a little bit about who they are. We've got with us today Philip Robinson and Edwin Sylvester from the RSC, and then we'll hear from our main speakers, Alice Motion and David Hu. So welcome to all of you. Now, Philip uh, here with us today is, uh, I work with at Chemistry World. He's the editor of Chemistry World, which is the RSC's flag flagship magazine covering the chemical sciences. He's got a PhD in chemistry from the University of Edinburgh, and he's spent most of his career working in science journalism. Edwin, who's with us, is Global Integrated Media Manager at the Royal Society of Chemistry. He joined the media team a decade ago, having previously worked in broadcasting for the BBC and in communications for a global financial services giant. So we're going to hear from them in a minute. Now, after them, we'll hear from Alice, who's Deputy Head of the School of Chemistry and Deputy Director of the Sydney Nano Institute at the University of Sydney. Alice leads the Science Communication, Outreach, Participation and Education Research Group and is recognised as a leading international science communicator. Alice was awarded the Eureka Prize for promoting public understanding of science in 2020. They're the creator of Live from the Lab, founder of the Breaking Good Citizen Science Initiative, co-host of ABC Science Podcast Dear Science and host of monthly science segment Science in Motion on ABC TV Breakfast. And then we'll also hear from David Hu, who is an author, mathematician, roboticist and biologist who is a currently an associate professor at the engineering department of Georgia Tech. His research centres on animal behaviour and movement and is noted for its eccentricity. David has twice won the Ig Nobel Prize for Physics. In 2015, he shared the prize with Patricia Yang for research on the duration of animal urination, of which we will hear more about soon, and I'm excited to hear about that. In 2019, David and his colleagues won the prize for studying the means of production of the cubicle faeces of wombats. So as you can tell, it sounds like this might be quite a fun session. 
So please don't forget to send in your questions as you hear from the guests today. But without further ado, let's hand over to our first guest, Phil, um, and then the other guests are welcome to turn off their cameras until it's time for them to present. So let's get Phil's presentation up. There we go. I'll hand it over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Natalie, and, uh, and hello to everyone. Um, I'm going to give a very quick overview of uh, how some of those interactions that uh, Natalie was just mentioning between, uh, at, from her time at The Guardian, um, how those interactions between uh, journalists and scientists typically work and what, uh, what each of you is looking to get out of that relationship, how to make the most of it. So um, if we go to the, uh, to the next slide, please. Um, so overall, why does a journalist want to speak to a scientist? So Natalie's already covered a little bit of that, but generally we're looking at um, for a, a few reasons, some of which I've listed here, um, because we want to write about your work most of the time. We think you're doing something interesting um, that we want to share with our readers. Um, or we might want to ask your opinion as an expert. You know a great deal about the field that you work in, certainly more than we do, and you can help us to add context and balance to a story that we're writing about that particular area. Um, and also, um, as Natalie's already noted, we really want to understand the science. We are not experts in every area, and so we need to talk to the experts to make sure that we understand the science well so that we're communicating it well to our readers. Um, and on the other side of that relationship, what are the scientists, um, what can they get out of that, that experience? Well, again, a variety of things, a few of which I've listed here. One is the potential to reach a very large audience, um, to raise the profile of yourself and your work, um, particularly with the public at large. Um, it's an opportunity to make sure that science is being covered accurately and, and responsibly in the media. Um, it helps you to develop your network. Having a few friendly journalists and cultivating that relationship can be really useful, but also it can develop your network with other scientists who might see your work being covered um, in the media. And it's a good way to hone your communication skills, of course. It's a very different style and type of mode of communication than you might be familiar with as a scientist working professionally. And so um, adapting your communication to that is a really good exercise for, for what is typically a, a lay audience. Um, next slide, please. So a couple of quick examples uh, that sort of um, exemplify some of those principles from uh, stories we've done, run recently in Chemistry World. First one on the left here is uh, about lab glove recycling schemes that have been set up by um, individuals in their institutions. So it's a really nice opportunity for us to raise the profile of that type of work so that other people can understand how it works and set up their own schemes in their own institutions. And we have um, Pre Duffy here talking us through some of the, the detail and the challenges that they faced in trying to do that so that other people can learn from them. Um, on the second uh, example there on the right, this is a good example of adding context and balance to a story. This is a paper that we covered a few weeks ago that caused a bit of a stir in the community. There was a lot of debate around it and then some people got quite heated at points. So really important for us in our coverage that we made sure that we had the balance and not just the authors talking about, you know, why they did the research, how it works and what they found, but also that saw an expert from the field saying, well, yes, it is very good research. And as you can see, Pally Thorderson here is saying, but perhaps there needs to be a little bit more work to investigate whether it really it backs up some of these other claims. So the story is richer for having that extra voice in there. Um, next slide, please. And the final slide. So this is a very quick overview of how the mechanics of how this process normally works. So um, the first stage is the invitation. Um, a journalist will typically get in touch with you, an email, a phone call, a direct message perhaps. And in that approach, they should make clear to you the following items. And if they don't, you should try to clarify that with them first and foremost. They should tell you what the story is that they're trying to write and who they're writing it for, so you have an idea of the audience. They should tell you why they want to speak to you specifically, what is it about your expertise that they think is relevant to this story, and obviously when do they want to talk, so that you know if you can meet their timeline. Um, some tips for that part of this process is to be prepared. If you're talking about your own research, um, have a think about a few key messages that you want to get across in that interview. Um, if it's somebody else's research or you, it's a press release or another paper, ask to see the press release, ask to see the paper so that you can prepare yourself prior to the interview. Um, be prepared to pass the mic as well. If you don't think you're relevant for the story um, or if you know someone who is better placed or you have someone's voice that should be a part of this story, then tell the journalist. It's always useful to know. 
Um, and talk to your press office. If your institution or your organization has a press office, then they will always be on hand to help you through that process. Um, the interview itself, a few items to think about here. Um, in the vast majority of cases, interviews will be on the record. That means that your words will be recorded, they will be used as part of the story, and they will be attributed to you in that story. So make sure you're happy with that. You'll want to know how long the interview is going to be so that you can prepare for that, put the right amount of time aside, and you'll want to know how is it going to be used ultimately in the, in the story. Um, again, some tips here um, are to ask your questions. The journalist has questions they want to ask you, but you should also ask your questions of the journalist. Some of the things we've just covered here, you'll also want to know when it comes to publication, when's the story going to run, where will it appear? Um, another key item that always comes up is scientists want to know, will I get sight of the story before it goes live? Um, so that's the little uh, grayed out eye symbol there. That's what that's representing. Most publications will say no, they don't offer that. Some publications might offer you the opportunity to check your quotes prior to the story going live for factual accuracy, but it's always worth checking with the journalist what the editorial policy is there so that you're, you're clear on that point. Another thing you might want to confirm is after the story has been published, if you're not, in the worst case, you're not happy with how your words have been used, who do you follow up with? Who do you get in contact with to start that process? Um, so that's a really important thing to get there as well. Um, more generally, when it comes to the interview itself, avoid jargon, keep your language simple and non-technical, of course, um, and be honest. If you think something you're being asked to comment on, there's something missing from it, or it's not particularly good, then say that, that's important to know. Um, and be succinct, obviously, in your answers. Um, if you would like a little bit more elaboration on those points, then the, the link at the bottom there will take you to a Chemistry World article that, um, that, that details some of those points in more length. But um, for now, I shall leave it there and hand back to Natalie. Lovely. OK, um, I think we're going to go straight on to Edwin now. Um, so if you'd like to bring his slides up. Thank you for that. I think we've got a lot of information there, which is going to be really handy to people. Um, and that link is going to be useful as well. So I think we'll get that shared in the chat for everybody. So, yeah, let's move on to Edwin. Hi, Edwin. Take it away. Hello. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, some excellent sort of introductory points there from Phil. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about two significant aspects of the way that we at the RSC choose to interact uh, with the media. So, um, Chris, if we could move on to the next slide, please. The, the first is helping scientists tell your stories of why your research matters. And there are a couple of um, excellent examples on the screen, uh, one of which I won't delve into too much because uh, the star of that story is going to be talking in, in greater detail. Um, but suffice to say, these generated a lot of media interest. And uh, although there's a lot of fun um, aspects to these stories, uh, there's a lot of serious science that goes into them as well. So um, that's that's one of the kind of major aspects that we, we look for when we're um, deciding which research that we uh, we sort of put our press office activities behind. So um, the uh, the soft matter um, paper, uh, we worked with David's research group and um, that was a, a sort of global um, media success. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a very, um, it was a fun topic and it was a lot of fun to be had on social media and with interaction with the media uh, more generally. This generated absolutely loads and loads of um, broadcast uh, and online uh, media coverage. Um, the second story on the right hand side there is um, some research from Edinburgh University where um, they managed to find a way of turning plastic waste uh, into uh, an extract that could be then used in flavouring um, vanilla. Uh, and the media really jumped on this one because um, it was sort of puns about ice cream, but also the fact that it was solving um, a major problem um, that was particularly kind of the, the zeitgeist buzzword in the media at that point um, with, with plastic waste. So um, very important for us to kind of help scientists to uh, put these pieces out as press releases and, and our team sort of helped to, to support with that interaction uh, with uh, media outlets around the world. So um, that's the, the first aspect. So we can move on to the next slide. I'll talk a little bit about how we also um, use a lot of the, the campaigning that we um, campaigning work that we do to tell stories about um, things that matter to us uh, as an organization. And we've really grown this side of our work in the past decade, campaigning on issues from inclusion and diversity to a real range of aspects of sustainability. Um, so uh, this particular story uh, came out a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, it's, it's a potentially very thorny scientific topic, looking at forever chemicals, and particularly the angle that we, uh, we were looking at was um, the uh, levels of PFAS in UK waterways. And um, our intention with this campaign is to actively change UK regulation uh, for the levels that are acceptable for these uh, forever chemicals with significant health impacts for human beings uh, and wildlife. And our approach here is to, um, to influence uh, MPs and other decision makers through the media. And so we, uh, we ran a press conference where we had lots of uh, national journalists dialing into uh, the press conference to hear from our in-house experts. Uh, and the result was um, a lot of coverage, so sort of 150 pieces of coverage a couple of weeks ago uh, across all sorts of exciting outlets from The Guardian and the BBC to our colleagues at Chemistry World, um, looking at different aspects of, of this story on PFAS. Now that's resulted in us being able to really put pressure on those MPs um, into hopefully um, changing legislation so that the levels of PFAS in UK water uh, will be reduced, which will protect um, many of us in the UK. So that's just a couple of examples of, of how we choose to, um, to use our interactions with the media. Um, I think as, as Phil outlined very well, there's, there's lots of opportunity for doing that in a very positive uh, way. And uh, I really look forward to hearing some more from Alice and David uh, for the rest of uh, this webinar. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Those were some brilliant examples. Um, and yeah, the coverage that that story got was amazing. And and it just shows you the power of the media. It's not all negative. We see the power the media can have on getting stories out there um, that are, are of real importance. Um, so let's come on to Alice, if you'd like to turn on your camera and let's get your screen shared. And, uh, and then, yeah, we're doing well for time. So I'd like, I'm excited to hear your talk. And then we'll have, uh, we've got some questions coming in actually, which is brilliant. So we'll be able to get on to those after. Do keep sending in questions, please, and from the audience. That, that would be brilliant. We'll put those to Alice and David at the end. There we go. We can see your uh, full screen. So take it away. Lovely. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, uh, lovely to be joining you all today. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm joining from this evening. Um, I'm in Sydney, I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, it's a pleasure to, to join this evening for this great seminar, um, and I'm looking forward to taking you through a few of my perspectives uh, uh, around um, engaging with the media as a chemist and putting chemistry up out there, um, up front into the media stories. Um, as a chemist, um, I, I'm interested to hear from your uh, the audience's shared experience here, but um, this paper that was published in 2019 really resonated with me, published by two colleagues, um, uh, uh, Webster and Hardy, Red, Rene Webster and Margaret Hardy in 2019, um, which really um, highlighted uh, some of the challenges in chemistry's lack of visibility compared to some of our colleagues in other scientific disciplines when we think about the representation in the media. Um, and I think it's absolutely wonderful to have outlets like Chemistry World um, that are really um, singing and shouting um, joyfully about chemistry. Um, but in terms of mainstream media, it can be a little bit challenging to get chemical or chemistry stories out there. Um, and in some of the work that Webster and Hardy highlighted, and the first couple of examples here are Australian based examples of two sort of flagship uh, TV and radio shows, Catalyst and The Science Show, um, and then perhaps uh, a format that, um, or a platform that um, many of you will be familiar with, um, IFL Science. They really highlighted that in these um, media platforms or programs um, that are so well established um, that chemistry doesn't always feature quite as prominently or as frequently as other um, science stories. And um, I'm interested to hear from people who are joining the webinar to see if that's a shared experience. But from my perspective, um, oftentimes uh, I, I know that it can be really challenging to try and get a chemical story into the mainstream media to try and find the hook um, that, that makes um, the journalist that one is interacting with really interested in a story. Um, and actually, I think as, um, from experience that sometimes 
chemistry tends to to find its way into the media in more reactive um, type pieces rather than proactive um, pieces of media coverage by which I mean if there's ever a chemical spill or something that's happened that's often a sort of a negative chemistry story you may be called up to ask for and asked for comment um, um, and although these stories are really important to comment on sometimes it feels that maybe chemistry gets a little bit of a negative representation in the media and so one thing that I think is really important and I know that uh, uh, Phil has touched on this already and Natalie did in their introduction, is to think about how as chemists and people who are passionate about chemistry, we can build relationships with, um, with the media, with journalists, um, and think about which mediums are most authentic or appropriate to each of us. So as Natalie mentioned, um, we should pick places and spaces that feel comfortable to us. So if we, if we enjoy writing, that's a, a fantastic medium if we enjoy speaking at radio or television or, or giving public lectures, lectures. But we really need to think about ways to engage uh, the public and journalists with our uh, uh, chemical stories, both the ones that are being produced in our laboratories, but also uh, to be able to comment on those that are emerging from, from other um, uh, groups and other institutions. And so um, one of the ways that, that I really recommend that people do this is to think about forging connections with, with journalists or with institutions. And one way that um, has been uh, really um, such a, a lovely partnership for me um, has been forming connections with uh, community radio stations. Um, and um, once one has built those those sort of relationships, it's much easier to try and uh, establish um, chemical stories as being part of uh, the, the science contact on these stations. Now, when we're thinking about pitching those chemical stories, we always have to think about our hook, as I've mentioned, and think very carefully about why the audience should care about the story but also why we care about it as chemists and and why that story is particularly interesting to us and if we try and think very carefully about these two questions i think uh, we stand a much better chance of, of getting those stories out there so as i mentioned before some of uh, the relationships that i first formed um, forged were with community radio stations and then uh, later on um, some partnerships with um, uh, the ABC here in Australia. Um, but one thing I wanted to emphasize is that no matter where we are in the world, um, and I know um, that people are joining from, from all over the world here, is there are so many different community and local radio stations and there are 24 hours to the day um, and uh, you know 60 minutes to each of those hours and each um, each of those minutes needs to be filled with some sort of content and science has a really important place to play so if we're able to build those relationships with uh, radio stations and to build that trust um, there could be a place for, for for more of us to be sharing science stories and chemistry more broadly um, and this is something that I was fortunate enough to do with FBI Radio in Sydney for around six years where I presented a weekly science segment. And that relationship enabled us to build new projects to think more creatively about sharing chemistry stories and science stories more broadly. And one of those projects that I'll mention here is Live from the Lab which enabled um, us to partner uh, local musicians with researchers from the University of Sydney, some of them chemists, some of them working on chemical projects. Um, and through this partnership, um, these the musicians that were um, part of this project, and it's ongoing, we've got another of these events in a couple of weeks' time, um, they um, had a, a very brief conversation with uh, the scientists that they were part partnered with, um, for about 90 minutes over Zoom, because this originated during COVID, and then created new musical compositions inspired by those conversations. And those tracks have been wonderful um, pieces of, uh, of, uh, of celebratory science um, and have, been, have enabled um, new audiences to, to come into these conversations about chemistry and science more broadly. 
Um, and just showing a few of the images from this project. So this is during COVID when we were all uh, working on Zoom and broadcasting um, um, on FBI radio from home. Um, but we've been able to feature these as um, in conversation events since um, the COVID restrictions have reduced. So put this on in the theater with these conversations between the scientists and the musicians featuring um, some live performances and some listening um, to each of these recorded tracks. And then we also featured this as part of a gig where each of the artists performed short sets, including the song that they'd composed for live from the lab. And these are just some of the artists from last year. And I'm gonna um, actually play a short clip of a musical video that was created um, by a Sydney-based band, Baby Beef, in response to a chemistry-based project from Dr. John Dannon from the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney. And I believe one of my colleagues here uh, on the chat is gonna play this video through their screen um, to, so that you can all hear the sound. But this is Golden Trauma um, by Baby Beef, um, composed um, in response to Dr. Jonathan Dannon's research in the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney. Oh, I never told myself to breathe I guess I never felt the need But something's telling me to breathe Through the cracks in my skin Letting half the world in And the other half is waiting So patiently Thank you so much. So, um, and then this project that was established as a project that was in collaboration with FBI Radio, uh, where I've been sharing science stories, including some of the stories that David is going to share with us um, this evening. So I've got a, a real fan moment of being on this webinar with David. Um, but this was then reported in um, the local um, press here in, in the Sydney Morning Herald um, and sort of comes full circle about thinking about how partnerships with media organizations can then generate further stories. And just to briefly touch on another project, um, some of the work that we've been doing in, in collaborative projects at the University of Sydney that have been established through interdisciplinary collaborations, um, such as the one you saw before with musicians, with colleagues from Sydney Conservatorium of Music, have expanded into projects uh, um, on fashion, photography, art, and visibility. So this is a project, this is a, a trailer that I'll play in the background as I speak. This is a, a project um, called Cloak, uh, which is um, one um, that celebrated queer scientists as part of Sydney World Pride, where each of these featured LGBTIQA plus scientists was partnered with fashion design students from the University of Technology Sydney who created bespoke labs, lab coats for each of the participants that spoke to the science identity, the queer identity and other aspects of each of these scientists and um, to challenge some of the traditional um, notions of what it is to be a scientist. And this project was uh, featured um, as part of a cultural festival. I think this is another great way to get chemistry, to get science out there, is to partner with uh, big cultural festivals and think about placing science at the heart of culture in this way. And it generated media interest. We were able to speak about this on the ABC um, and to really profile some of the queer scientists who are part of, of this, telling their personal stories alongside the science, which I think is a really effective way um, to try and get very significant and important science stories out there is to bring the personal so that we connect with new audiences. Um, and I'll wrap up there. I've got many people to thank because of course, um, the things that I've talked about are very much uh, collaborative projects. They're 
they're not my own, um, including the Nanasonic Stories team with some of the work on Life from the Lab and the Cloak team, um, particularly our colleagues, uh, Shireen Fard, Lee Wallace, Todd Robinson and Victoria Rawlings. And then uh, there's a few other folks to thank here, including my research group who are um, pictured on this slide. So I'll wrap up there, but thank you very much um, for, for um, the time to, to talk a little bit about ways that we can try and get chemistry out there. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, and I, I love seeing this because I, I didn't really allude to this in my introduction, but actually when I was saying, you know, I enjoy speaking on radio and TV. I think it's really fun. I get a real thrill from it. Um, and it really puts me on the spot and gets me thinking and, and it, it just feel more alive when I do that. And that's my style. That's the way I like to communicate. And I've done different outreach projects over the years. Um, and often we're told to think about our audience, aren't we? We're told, well, what's, it, what's the audience you're trying to reach here? And actually, sometimes I think it's slightly the wrong way around. I think, actually, let's think about what our communication style and the things we enjoy and then I feel there's just more integrity to it like you are, I think I can probably guess that you quite like music and you like being involved in that scene and so you this these are the kind of projects you involve yourself in because that's something you enjoy doing and I feel like as scientists that's also a really good aspect of science communication that we're real people we have all these other interests in life and actually, if we can say, look, we're a scientist, but we can also do all these other cool things and uh, and collaborate with different people and do exciting projects. I think that's a really important, um, really important aspect of, of how we communicate. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. I, I assume you do like music. I'm not sure you, you're I, someone yeah, who hates it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so important because, you know, I think we talk about it a lot when we're when we're teaching science. We um, people's enthusiasm or love for a subject really comes through. Um, and it's hard to fake that enthusiasm. It, it's, uh, and I think that when it comes to thinking about partnerships to get science out there, particularly to new audiences or to audiences who don't yet know that they like science or aren't, who aren't traditional science audiences, um, if it's anchored in another aspect of uh, culture or of art or of something that that ties into popular culture, it can reach. Um, new people or make connections in different ways but to try and do that as a science communicator in a place that you're not particularly interested in it's inauthentic too and I think that yeah. that is that people can can spot that and so they want to see that this love or this joy for an art form or for a for a scientific story or for a collaboration I think that has to come through completely agree i'm going to ask one quick question from the audience um and this is this is for you and they say could you please elaborate on how exactly the scientists and the musicians collaborate to create the music was there a lot of back and forth or did you create a you know a guide for them or what you expected so um so this project was born um out of um so it was seeded by a project that started on FBI radio when the musician Obscura Hale or Sean Conran, he actually, um, I, I met him uh, through the music scene in Sydney and he was a, he's, he still is a very prolific songwriter. And he, um, I met him through a friend and he said, I would be able to compose a new musical track that um, connects to one of the science stories that you'll be talking about on your segment and he was so prolific and so quick and so wonderful that he was able to do that and he did that on a couple of occasions and that project had so much joy but it was something that we wanted to make happen um, uh, in in a sort of a bigger and bolder way when um, the national science week in australia suddenly turned to online during COVID 19 we thought this is potentially a, a moment where we could try and change our original plans for National Science Week and run this project. And rather than moving to webinars as a way of reaching um, remote audiences, why don't we use radio, which has done a fantastic job at, at connecting people over distance for a really long time. So this, it had a very short window before National Science Week. So the way that we did this is we had a Zoom conversation that I joined and sort of facilitated a conversation between the scientist and the musician. And then the musician, after this 90 minute conversation, went away 
and composed a, a piece of music. They had the recording of this chat, but it was based really on the emotional connections formed within this 90 minute discussion. And the emphasis of this part of the project, and I'll stop now because there's, there's lots of other parts of the project too, was to really create a piece of music that has had this emotional connection. So it, it wasn't supposed to be um, a, a didactic form of science communication or to, to, in, to instruct us about a, a type of science, but really to create a piece of art that people enjoy listening to and that opens up the next step to the conversations around the science. And that's what we had those on the radio and in, in our events. So I hope that answers the person's question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it does. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to David um, because we've got another presentation to go. But then, Alice, I'm going to invite you back on screen at the end. Um, so to the audience, please do keep sending in your questions. If you've got anything else for Alice, and we'll come back to them at the end. Hi, David. Right, you're on screen. And then we're going to change tack slightly. Could we bring up the poll? Because we've got a quick poll for you. Um, you may This may not apply to people in the audience, but if you haven't done any science communication, we're actually wondering why, why haven't you done any? Um, and this is a question that David's actually posed to you. You can click on the screen to put your response. It's absolutely fine if you don't have a response. You can even put something in the chat to us if you have another reason. Um, and then I will just show the results in a minute. So we've got, you might be too busy to do science communication. Absolutely, scientists are very busy people. I get that. Um, it seems like an extra task to do sometimes. Um, you might not feel like you have the skills. You might be worried that you might make a mistake. I've just made a mistake. I forgot the poll. It's OK. Everyone tends to forgive you. Um, some scientists uh, said they, it's a waste of time. Maybe senior colleagues or junior colleagues might be telling you, oh, no, it's a waste of time talking to people about your science. Um, or is it that you don't know where to learn, um, which is which is another one. Well, you're here. You're in the right place. So we're already you're already doing something good. So um, quite a few of you have voted. I'm going to give you a couple more moments. OK, well, we'll end the poll there because I don't want to waste too much time. Um, we've got 42 percent of people um, said they didn't know where to learn um, and 42 percent felt they didn't have the skills. So that is quite interesting, David. Um, and 32 percent were also too busy, which is which is a real concern. Um, but luckily, no, nobody thought it was a waste of time or people weren't telling them it's a waste of time. So it seems like everyone's in the right place. Um, we're going to hand over to David if you want to discuss those results or maybe just get straight into this presentation. I'll leave it with you. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm glad you all don't think it's a waste of time uh, and I'm, uh, that you're using this uh, webinar to learn more about uh, communicating with the public. Um, I wanna show you a few of the um, uh, techniques we use for photos and video. Um, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, um, you might be familiar with these gourds. Um, every year, there's been a competition to build, to grow the world's largest pumpkin. And um, this one, I think, is uh, 1,200 pounds on the right. I took this picture standing next to a little girl. In photos, I try to show how big the object is, and I usually take it next to some everyday object. Um, and this girl had me just standing there. And the left, you see a time lapse video of the pumpkin growing from, you know, a tiny little, tiny little thing all the way up to something that's going to crush the average human being. Um, and this is a great example of what photos can't do. I mean, the photo can get your attention. Um, for example, that photo on the right, you immediately see what this pumpkin is. You immediately um, uh, see how big it is. And the process of it growing can't really be shown through uh through photos, and that's you need, that's what you need video. And throughout the next 10 minutes, I want to show you some examples of where photos and videos can also can do justice. Um, and when we wrote this paper on giant pumpkins, we needed to mathematically model it. And to do that, we actually need to know how the pumpkins changed in size. So there's a website called bigpumpkins.com. Reached out to these uh, farmers, and we we convinced them to chop their pumpkins in half. You know, these they're prized possessions, chopping them in half so we can actually examine the cross section. And that's where we discovered that as the pumpkins grow, they don't actually change in proportion. Uh, their thickness uh, to diameter ratio stays the same. And that's what you can see here. Um, they do have really strange things happening. Um, for example, that pumpkin on the bottom right, um, and we simulate these things by actually crushing pumpkins in the lab. Um, 
that pumpkin on the bottom right actually becomes concave because as it grows, it can't beat the forces of friction. And so it has no choice but to grow upward. Um, a lot of the work I've done is with hydrophobic surfaces and surface tension. And uh, these um, things that are involving surface tension are usually quite small. Uh, for example, like this little water drop on this ant's head. Um, or this ball of ants that actually experiences a kind of a surface tension because each of these ants, just like water molecules, are trying um, to stay close to each other and they're trying not to escape. So you get this hamburger-sized ball that looks like a looks like it's got um, surface tension holding it in. A lot of times we take video and images looking for something, but a lot of the best images and video happen when we're not looking for something. For example, um, these are two water starters on the water surface. Um, I call them two parents having a discussion. And they're showing you that it's not just possible to just walk on water, but you can run, fight, jump, and wrestle um, all without breaking the water surface. And I took this video just for fun, uh, but it, for me, it actually told the story of how these insects stay water repellent far more than anything else. And uh, I think I would just urge you to keep your eyes open when you're doing experiments. You might find something that uh, might tell your story better than you expected. To tell the story of how hydrophobic these legs are, um, we have to turn to photos, and all, not just photos, but computer graphics, which is these days is becoming a really, really good resource. Um, for example, the legs of these insects is the thickness of a human hair. And what you're seeing on the left is this leg actually standing on the water surface. and Unlike your foot touching the ground, only the very tip of the leg actually penetrates to the surface. And the reason for that is that legs are standing on a cushion of air for the water to wet the large surface area presented by each of the hairs, they would have to provide a huge amount of uh, energy. So instead they just stand on the tips. Um, and this, these images, we spend a lot of time um, uh, reading the literature, looking at the scanning electron micrographs and uh, uh, editing these, but I mean, they took many, many hours, but they were well worth it because in just a few seconds, you can understand what I'm talking about. This is another image that was taken by accident. There's a photograph of an insect walking on the water surface. And uh, a long time ago, people, so you can see the legs, they look like um, oars, but you notice there's uh, something missing at the tip of the oar. It's a blade to help push the water. And these insects are able to walk on water because they actually deform the water surfaces, generate these menisci, sort of a divot. And those divots, which are filled with air, actually act like the blades of the oar. And that's how you can see these structures in the back. So there's lots of things going on in this image that make it work. Uh, first of all, it's a beautiful color, um, Van Gogh textures. Um, it's got the insect, it's got some other things like this starburst of um, large thymol blue. Um, it's, a, it's a dye. Um, and um, all these work together and it feels like it's dynamic, but it's just a static image. We worked a long time on this. Variations of this image have gone all over the world. Uh, for example, that's a textbook of a mechanical engineering uh, textbook that I use. Um, it's gone all over these publications. I would suggest you keep variations uh, because um, every journal location is going to want a different uh, variation of the theme. and uh, uh, there's is everything subjective, so some people might like some better than the others. We also studied how mosquitoes survive rainstorms, and unfortunately, they survive them without an issue. Um, and that's because um, as the raindrops fall, if they hit your hand, they explode because your hand provides a large resistance force to these uh, raindrops, um, and you so you feel the raindrop and it hurts. But for mosquitoes, um, they're so lightweight that as they get hit, they just deflect or um, uh, deflect the raindrop and uh, they don't actually experience that much force because they're not slowing it down. Remember, force is change in momentum over time. And if you're not slowing the object, you're not gonna get a huge, huge amount of force. Um, this, as you can imagine, this image, this video um, took a long time to get. Uh, we just put a whole bunch of mosquitoes in a very small container and uh, waited for luck to happen. And if you wait long enough, it does. So how did I take those images on the left? Um, well, 
there's an amazing there's amazing photographers at each of your institutions um uh, you have whole a lot of scientists don't know but universities pay um, to have uh, media relations experts um, come and try to document your science um, at the time we needed what macro photography so we built this whole setup uh, this in the very center here um, is a mosquito that's uh that's basically stuck to the edge of um kind of a human hair and uh, we incorporate all these flashes and um we incorporate all these flashes to time, and we have an automatic uh, drop release mechanism that uh, uh, then we time the photos through a laser that the drop crosses. This took about three weeks uh, to get this photo, um, but it was well worth it. So what you're seeing here is um, a typical uh, site if you come to Atlanta, Georgia. This is we have this and 25 of the United States, and much of the world around the equator is. Um, invaded by fire ants. Uh, fire ants lived in the uh, Pantanals of Brazil, this uh, wetland that was very flat, and they learned to survive these annual floodings by licking their bodies together and forming this kind of a uh, pretty gross fire ant raft. The water starters I showed you earlier are able to repel water by virtue of being hairy, but these insects, um, they can do it by combining their legs together and licking up to make this sort of hydrophobic network. Um, so you can see it's really, really um, it's effective at getting rid of get, getting water out. Um, not just that, but the ants have amazing material properties. Uh, this is a nice video for your nightmares where you have, imagine pulling one of these ant balls apart and don't worry, none of these ants are getting injured. They actually use very small drops of glue to glue each other together while, um, while adhering in these bowls. So I'll show you uh, two or three last videos here. Um, we studied a uh, black soldier fly, which are a insect for, considered as a solution to the world's waste problem. And what they do is they eat uh, very quickly and uh, we would, the dream is that we would grind up these insects and make into protein uh, for fish and chicken, because uh, there's no sustainable protein source for those animals now. Um, and we wanted to show how quickly they ate and we want to also give you an idea how big they were so everyone likes pizza until they saw this video. Oh, I should have warned you. This was uh, <laughs> this is a little gross image. Okay, so um, as Alice knows, uh, there's wombats in Australia, but unfortunately they're killed by cars on a daily basis. Um, and uh, my collaborator Scott Carver, um, he collected this poor wombat from the side of the road, and um, the wombat is uh, 30 kilograms, about the size of a large toddler. Um, but its intestines are the same length as a human's intestines, about um, 10 meters long. And uh, for a long time, people thought they made uh, cubic feces by having square um, anuses. But in fact, if you dissect them, you find them that the feces is cubic inside the body. Um, and this picture has so much. Um, I, I asked, I said, we need to have the wombat in the picture so people see the wombat, that this is not fake. Um, it shows the progression of time as you go from basically like uh, yogurt-like slurry to um, objects that have you know edges and uh, and flat faces. I mean, it's, this is it's an amazing process. Um, last thing I'll show you before I conclude is this um, evolution of the urinary system. And uh, the amazing thing is all these animals are urinating. Um, if you're very small, uh, you actually don't generate enough pressure to uh, generate a urine stream. So these rats, for example, that's the best they can get. They just generate urine gumballs um, that they splatter all over the place. Um, female, their mothers actually have to lick their urethras to make sure they can actually pee when they're really small because they can't get it out. Um, this is a jet of a goat. This is what you did before this webinar, or since it's a webinar, maybe that's what you're doing right now. Um, this is a cow. Um, generating what we call fluid fish bones. This is the last thing you want to see when you're milking a cow. It's about a gallon of uh, pee. And this is this is my favorite video of all time because part one and part two of my student's PhD thesis all in the same video. Um, I need to actually show that one more time. This is an amazing, amazing video because you see things that are solid uh, can be fluid if you hit them hard enough. And uh, we had to wake up at 6 a.m in the morning to uh, pick up that elephant urine. All right, um, so 
the this I just showcased kind of like the last 10, 15 years of the highlights of what we used photos and video for. So remember, photos, um, they, uh, they're versatile. Um, they're, I would say, the purest form of um, visual communication. Uh, they're fastest for your eye to see, your eye can recognize it in a fraction of a second. And if you make it recognizable and you use the standard rules of photography, you can make this a lasting photo, but be prepared to sweat for it. Videos, I don't think I've mastered this um, this area, but um, shorter is better. 10 seconds is plenty to show what you're talking about. Um, and it, it can tell the whole story um, uh, because it has a beginning, a middle, and end. And if you're going on social media, I think these will become more and more relevant. Um, I'm going to close there. If you liked what you saw, um, there's some of these photos in my book and uh, how to walk on water and climb on walls and uh, my new book for um, little children on the penis called The P Word. So I'm happy to open up for questions. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you. I was giggling away through much of that. Although, yeah, that pizza video. Yeah, not sure I can look at pizza in the same way now. Um, I have a quick question. Which do you prefer? I, I get the impression it might be photos because you feel like it's more you've done, you've got more experience maybe working with photos. But which, do you have a preferred mode of communicating? I used to like photos. Um, and I still do because I'm kind of a, it's kind of cl a classic. Like I think um, it can, so it's so versatile. You can put on a keychain, you can put on a t-shirt. Um, you get a lot of bang for your buck and uh, especially when you're limited time. Um, but uh, I like video more and more because the cameras are getting cheaper and better and faster. Um, and I think videos are in some ways more likely to go viral um, than photos. Mm -hmm. and that's what we need right now. We need more viruses. <laughs> Um, there's a question about the controversy of manipulated images in science and some people think it's dishonest um, and certainly we've seen evidence that you know manipulated images can be used in a dishonest way but other people feel like it can clarify the information you're communicating and um, what are your thoughts on that and how much do you manipulate images that you, you use? Um, we don't do any Photoshop. Um, when we do photos, uh, what we'll do is maybe change the uh, lighting. I mean, a lot of things uh, that you do with the um, Photoshop contrast, lighting, um, highlights, and things like that, those could you be done with lights. So anything that I feel like I could do with lights, I think is fine to do. Um, and I see it as a personal challenge not to Photoshop it. And I mean, honestly, people can really tell. Um, people can tell if, if, if you've added like an extra gallon of elephant pee or something like that. I mean, people can tell in a second if this doesn't look right. And um, so I see it as a personal challenge to try to keep it pure and uh, just show show what I see, see uh, using the correct lighting. Yeah, okay, thank you. I do want to bring up your second poll. We are running short on time, but I think it's a really fun poll. So um, this is a fun one. Why does David Hu do science communication? Um, the first one, he wants to hang stuff on the walls. Yep. Um, if you've seen in this in this webinar, behind me on the wall is all the stuff I've done, and I like to hang it on my walls. So that's a great reason to do science communication. Um, do we think he does it because it improves the science? Do we think it allows him to meet weird people? Yes, I expect so. Um, it in, does it inspire young scientists and engineers, um, or does he do it because uh, it's a lifetime a lifetime skill that uses both sides of the brain? I'm going to keep an eye on. People clicking the answers. Um, the most popular answer was it inspires young scientists and engineers. And um, is that true, David? Which was your reasoning for doing science communication? Well, this is a trick question because um, I thought it was all of them. Um, but uh, I think oh. the one thing that people don't understand, a lot of people don't expect, that is, it does improve your science. It does. I mean, as all of us know, we're submitting to journals. We're constantly competing for funding and uh, for um, the attention of other scientists. And we have to remember that scientists are people too. They are attracted to visual things. They um, want to understand and they have limited time. So the more we learn the skills of how to effectively convey our message um, with uh, images, video, and uh, Music, like Alice showed us, I think the better off we are and the more um, uh, discussion we'll get with other scientists. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do feel like I've learned a lot from communicating science. It's Whether it's my own science, it's really you have to understand it in so much more detail than you thought you did because you're breaking it down to the simplest form. And then you realize, oh, actually, I've got basic questions about what I'm doing, which seems ridiculous. But 
you learn a lot about it. And then when you're talking about other people's science and they're communicating it to you, you're learning. And I think it's just fantastic. Um, I'd love to bring Alice back on screen now. We've got a few, very few minutes before we end. Um, as, as usual, we're always rushed for time because we've got lots of questions coming in. Um, but let's try and get through a few questions. Which is my first one? I've lost it already. It is. Hold on a minute. I'm just bringing up my questions. Um, okay, so um, we've talked a lot about um, how uh, all the different types of communication um, and things that we can do. We've looked at all these different ways, all these different mediums. Um, what's it from either of you? What's your top tip to someone starting out in science communication now? We've got a lot of people on the call who say they didn't have the skills, they don't know where to learn. Um, what's the best way to learn? Where's the best place to start? Um, let's go with Alice first. Um, well, my, my top tip is to start. So you only get better at doing anything if you if you have a go at it. Um, and you can do a lot of thinking about how you'll communicate. And that's really important. But there's no substitute for, for getting out there and, and, and trying to speak to the public. That said, I would pick a, a medium that you enjoy, that you feel where you feel your strengths are. If you are nervous or shy, think about something that you can pre-record or that you can write yourself so that you own the message that goes out there. If you'd rather respond to, to questions and you feel like that will give the best of yourself, go for it. And maybe rather than doing it for the first time on a major national broadcaster, um, go somewhere, go, go to somewhere where you have friendly um, um, journalists, other people who are learning at the same time, community radio is a great place to learn and to develop your skills. And David, I'll, I'll add on to that, actually, because you've got a thriving research group. Um, and do you, I mean, this is, is this a message you give to your students and postdocs? What kind of advice do you give them about communicating their research to non-expert audiences when they haven't, you know, done anything before? Um, uh, I think the most important thing is to find a mentor. Um, there, um, I mean, like we said in the very beginning, there's there are pushbacks against doing science communication. We have limited time, and there, I mean, frankly, there are many scientists that don't uh, don't uh, want to do it and don't um, don't think it's worth it. And um, maybe those probably shouldn't be doing it. But for the rest of us, um, you need to find a mentor who who cares about it and can get you through the difficulties and the, the challenges of learning. Um, so finding a mentor is the most important. And um, I tell my students that if you can't find one, one mentor, every little bit of the way you'll pe meet experts that you can learn a little bit from. Um, every person that interviews you, you'll see how they carry themselves and what kind of questions they ask. Um, every journalist that covers your work, you'll see all the choices they made for choosing particular details to convey and which images to use. And um, from that, you eventually, over time, you'll get an idea of what works and what doesn't work. Um, that sounds brilliant. Thank you. Um, OK, let's see. One more question before we end, because I don't want to keep everybody. I know everyone's got probably lots of other things to be doing after this meeting. Um, let's have a little look. Have you ever, um, when you've engaged with the media and talked about your research, what have you done before that? Have you talked to audiences before that to learn a little bit about their experience with the topic? How important is it for you want to understand sort of what the public know before you then go out and give them all this exciting research and talk about the science and we've got to get a kind of a level first or do you speak to people before you do any media work how's that work I'll, I'll jump in um so i think it it depends a little bit i think in in generally speaking um early on i was trying to do work with schools or in libraries or in the community um and by doing sort of library talks or um talks in the community you get a sense of what questions are out there and which questions keep on appearing and whether you need to tweak your presentation make sure you answer those questions or or you can get a sense that that might be a question that the audience who's listening to the radio or watching the television might also have that question too. So I think um, speaking to young people, speaking in the community is a great way um, to do that. The other way to do that is simply by talking to your friends. 
or your family, people who are not in the same area as you and trying to have conversations about your work um, that don't alienate them, um, that are free from jargon and allow the conversation to continue and see what organic questions they come up with because they'll probably be in common with, with other people too. Absolutely. I think, you know, that's really important. You, you practice on your family and friends, don't you? And it's a case of learning then. Oh, OK, I didn't explain that. They're glazing over. I'm obviously not making sense. And and I think that is part of this science communication journey that you need to make. I don't think anyone comes into it knowing exactly how to communicate with all these different audiences. But actually, yeah, I kind of learned along the way. I made mistakes. As you said, I went into schools. I spoke to young people and I really kind of learned what they knew, what their level of understanding was, what they're learning at school now compared to what I was learning, because it's completely different. Um, so I think, yeah, that's that's really great advice. David, have you got anything to add on that? I think practicing Practicing, there's pl plenty of chances to practice uh, at conferences. I mean, even if someone's at a conference, they might not be exactly in your field. So being able to explain something in a short way using analogies. Um, but I think it's also important not to, you don't want to copy so the way someone else does things either. You do want to, uh, surprisingly, like the media, they're looking for authentic and original and they're looking for different kinds of people. So you're going to have a, viewpoint and you should just try it and see if, see if it works. Brilliant advice. Okay, I'm really sad that we're going to have to um, end it there for today, um, but I hope this session has left you feeling inspired to go out there and give some outreach and communication a go in whatever way you feel is right for you. We've heard of so many different ways to communicate with the public and the most important thing, as we've heard, is just to get started. Experience is key. I'd like to say a big thank you to our wonderful guests today, Alice Motion and David Hu, who gave us some brilliant ideas um, for you to go out and get started in your science communication journeys. And we also heard from Philip Robinson and Edwin and Sylvester from the RSC. And thank you to you, our audience, for getting involved in the polls and the conversation and asking some fantastic questions to our panel. Now, this session has been recorded and will be shared with everyone who registered for the event. It'll also be available on demand on the Chemistry World website and the RSC members area. I'm Natalie Starkey from Chemistry World, and I look forward to seeing you again in a future Chemistry World webinar.